So in the room today, we have two mistranslations. This is whatever this mistranslation everyone has, and then there's this other one here, which is a much older one, which has different mistranslations. So it's useful to have more than one translation. Uh, that's the famous statement on on Isaac Newton's uh, website, which is interesting that he has a website. But when he at his death, at least what I read, this goes back about two or three years ago, when he died, he had three or four or five even different translations of the Hebrew Bible into a language that he knew because he did not know Hebrew. And he figured cleverly that, you know, if, the, if there are different translations for the same sentence, then probably none of them, neither, not one is correct because if one were correct, you wouldn't have the others. Right, uh, and so for the most obvious example of it being different, we've done this, Yale has heard this several times, but, it, but this is not the topic of the class, but I just want to show you one classic example, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. You want a text? Right here. Right, where'd it go? Yeah, grab this. Okay, first sentence of the Bible. And uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. So will someone read it? Yeah, do you mind reading from this book here? This is the, this is the other mistranslation. Genesis chapter 1, someone, anybody have it? The Hebrew is the same in all the books in the room. Chapter now, one? chapter 1, verse 1 of Genesis. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. There are five books to the opening to the Hebrew Bible. Of the, it's called the Torah. After there are many other writings, the whole thing is called the Tanakh, which means Navim. It's... it's uh, abbreviations for like the prophets and the writings and you put those abbreviations together you get the word Tanakh. The T is the Torah. So that's the five books of Moses. Someone please read Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 other than Yael. In the beginning of God's creating the heavens and the earth. Okay now Yael will read from the other mistranslation which is an older one. It's a better Bible. It's called the, it's called the Jerusalem Bible. It's not the Jerusalem translation. The Jerusalem translation is 1900 years old and it's a much more accurate one, but these are more modern. But this is called the Jerusalem Bible. The one you have in front of you is like the stone edition. Yes? In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. Okay, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but you notice, again, anyone else? So, so we're not getting, make sure that he's not telling us a lie. Can you read your Genesis? You speak English? Yeah. Genesis. Also, English. Uh, what? Uh, in the beginning of God's creating the heavens and the earth. And now, yeah, we'll read the other mistranslation. In big, you hear the problem? The difference. It's the first sentence of the Bible. It's pretty depressing at the first sentence of the Bible, including in you know, Korea. I mean, it's pretty. So, if one were correct, you wouldn't have the other. And they're vastly different because the, the second word of the Bible everyone holds by the fact is created. Yet the translators of this Bible here, which is the one you all have in front of you, I've do it deliberately on the screen there, it didn't bother them. They knew it was created, but to make their mistranslation work, they changed it, created, ED, past, Beit Resh Aleph, the second word of the Bible, is created. Everyone holds by that. There's no debate about that. The problem is on Genesis chapter, the first word of the Bible. But they just changed created into creating, because after all, it's only God's word, you know. By Tuesday, you wrap the fish in it away and throw it in the garbage. So what does it matter, right? I mean, it's just a newspaper, so it doesn't really matter. You want to get uh, a copy of a, of a Tanakh. Anyone have two in front of them? Okay. So, so that's, that's, the, that's the, and the basic problem, if neither one can be, would be correct, because the other obviously wouldn't be present. Now, the irony, I just said this, I apologize for going over what I've said in previous week's classes, but this translation, which has a bit of biblical text and a, and a lot of commentary on the bottom, this part, which, which those of you that have the thicker book like that there, the Tanakh, don't have this commentary, but this is called Rashi, here near 1090. Rashi points out the error that it can't be created or creating because of the problem of the word. And in this Rashi right here, he says explicitly that this translation is wrong. That's the irony. I mean, the text, his own commentary, his commentary on the text, which they include, says this translation in the beginning of God's creating is wrong. 
because creating is not spelt Beit Reish Aleph, the second word of the Bible. Creating is spelt with, with four letters, not with three letters. The difficulties in Breshit, and we're going to go, I don't want to spend any more time on it, but I just want to show how important it is, if you don't know Hebrew, to make commentaries on the, on the, on the text. The, you know, you wouldn't make a critical analysis of Shakespeare if you didn't know English and you only knew Hebrew. I mean, you'd be pretty stupid to do that. Wouldn't be ignorance. It'd be stupidity. You know, I mean, Shakespeare and the Hebrew is considerably different than Shakespeare in the in the old English that he wrote. In any event, that's the problem. The correct translation is with the first cause. The correct translation, which matches the Hebrew, is ba reshit with a first cause, but with a first cause, and the first cause is wisdom. We learned that from the Jerusalem, not from the Jerusalem Bible, from the Jerusalem translation in 1900, or from Nachmanides, I learned it from Nachmanides. With the first cause of wisdom, God created the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis chapter one, verse one. But, it, but the, of wisdom doesn't fit into the text. So it's with the first cause, and then in brackets, of wisdom. And that of wisdom comes as Rashi sends us to proverb number eight, where it says, I am wisdom. God made me as the beginning of God's ways. Before there was an earth, uh, wisdom was formed. Wisdom is the substrate of the world. The text is not saying that God was wise to make the universe. That's not what the text says. It says God, like a potter uses clay to make a, uh, a, a, a vessel. God used wisdom, as bizarre as it sounds, except just study a bit of the writings of every major quantum physicist today, the physics that allows your iPhone to work, and they will say, well, we've been saying that for 100 years, so why are you, why are you lying to me that the Bible says that? You just jumped on our qu quantum physics, but it's off by 3,400 years, you realize. The Torah's been saying it, but we've had this mistranslation from the Septuagint. That's the problem with the Septuagint. The Septuagint doesn't even say God created the world, just God made the world, because the Greeks didn't hold by creation. It doesn't say God created the universe, God made, but the word creation is clear in the text. Yes, so yes, Robert. is wisdom the laws of physics? Wis wisdom is part, wisdom, the part of wisdom that we can figure out is part of the laws of nature. Yeah, physics would be part of that. So science, in other words, the laws of nature would be part of, the, a part of that wisdom. And we see consistently that God uses the laws of nature when the laws of nature can get the job done. It doesn't mean that there are never any miracles, okay? That's the conference we just had last week where you go every, every complicated organ in the human body, you can get it by making mutations, but the mutations have to be tweaked in the right direction, in other words. You, know, you hear what I'm saying? The difficulty is the number of mutations that are required. Of course, the Big Bang didn't produce chopped liver and, and you know, for the Christians, ham and eggs. The Big Bang, big, the big bang produced energy. And that energy had to change into people. And it did. Every, all science holds by the Big Bang produces a blast of energy, and over time, it became people. So the question that we, we wanted, well, anyway, so wisdom, that's what Proverbs 8 says so beautifully. I am wisdom. God made me as the beginning of God's ways. Before there was an earth, before the heavens were set, I was present. So the Big Bang creation, and then, then let's get on to the age of the universe. The Big Bang creation, when I look, at, when I look at, at, at the data coming out of NASA, when I look at the data coming out of, out of NASA, so I see, uh, Something, if I can, yeah. you know, the, the diagram I've sold, sold properly 2,000 times in this class. This is direct, directly from Na National Space Authority, NASA, WMAP, and you get it. Everyone should own this. It's the most major theological statement that science will ever be able to make. There was a creation to the universe from absolute nothing. From nothing physical, the universe brings the This is science. This is not, this is not Jerry Schroeder or Isha Torah. It's, it's science. Light beams became alive. It's a time diagram. The creation is a burst of energy. Billions of years go by, and on this oval is where we live. Oval because the universe is expanding in all directions. Here's the here's this satellite that mapped all of this. And what do we find? Light beams became alive. And whether it took six thousand years, six days, or fourteen billion years is insignificant. Well, to the fact that light beams, light beams, energy became alive. I mean, that's what science says. These are the most major statements science will ever be able to make. 
And God, and according to science, God could use the laws of nature. Ed Tryon pointed this out in 1973, that if you have the laws of physics, here it's written quantum fluctuation, and Ed Tryon was the first to point this out in the journal Nature, one of the two most important journals, science journals worldwide, that if you have the laws of nature, quantum physics, and the laws of relativity, you can create the universe from absolutely nothing physical. You have a virtuality that becomes a reality. And we see that in physics regularly. The particles are popping in and out. You don't see it. We can be measured. In any event, that's the beginning, and that's us here. So the session today, but, but anyway, that's, that's the wisdom. Yeah, so Robert, it would be, it would be uh, partly the laws of nature, but there's other wisdom that we get also from the, from, from the Torah itself. We get wisdom. Wisdom, act this way and don't act that way. The whole Western world is built on the wisdom, you know, the sociological wisdom of, of the Torah. So, uh, you know, so, uh, so what? So, so it says. Okay. So, I mean, so if you, do, if you diagram this, so you have the Big Bang creation of the universe. And that would be a quantum fluctuation, as we see from that diagram of QF. Yields a big bang creation. You know, next. And what does that do? Well, that produces energy. Okay, that's a good idea. And then Einstein tells us that energy can become matter. And then clearly that matter became alive because you got something down here, looks like it's made by people. You get life, you get, mo you get brain, and then you get mind. Mind, I think, is metaphysical, but this is physical, this is physical, this is physical, and then you get from the metaphysical into the physical, like that. But, the t but, but now we understand from the first word of the Bible that this is not the whole story. That's the story that science tells us. But out here, we got something else. We got God, your table of K, and that first emanation is wisdom. And wisdom produces the energy, and that's the quantum fluctuation. I guess you call it like that. And so that's, that's, now that matches very much what we know from modern physics today that you can, that you can have, as I try and point it out. It's 1973, so it's decades and decades ago. So, uh, so we have that. Okay, now the question that remains is that science says that from here to here is 14 billion years, one, two, three, one, two, nine zeros. These are three zeros. And, and Bible, that's, that's science. And Torah says, or, so, well, first of all, we get this number by looking into space, seeing light from deep space coming in, and thanks to the work of Edward Hubble and, 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 what's the first name? Levitt, suddenly, in Vermont, I think it's Henrietta Levitt. It, mine jumped out. Levitt, the two of them together, gave us the wisdom of being able to measure the stretching of, of light waves and the distance that they're coming from in the stars. So looking at stars from galaxies at great distance, they travel to us from great distance to get to us, right? So, but the universe is expanding. So as they travel through expanding space, the wavelength is stretched out. Can you measure the amount of stretching from this distance of a galaxy? That's the work of Henry Levitt as Hubble. She was put up for Nobel Prize, but she died of cancer before she got it. All of Hubble's work is based on her insights, all of every, every measurement, except the of close in galaxies. There would be no Hubble telescope in the sky today for enough of her. But she's dead. She died of cancer. She didn't get the, he put her up for a Nobel Prize, but she died of cancer, so no one ever heard of her name. Anyway, at different distances, you measure the difference in the stretching, and then you unstretch, mathematically unstretch those wavelengths, and it takes about 14 billion years to get them back to be the light waves in the unstretched situation. So that's how we get this number. This number is getting gotten by adding up the ages in the Torah. And it's interesting, like if you just jump forward, to ch Adam and Eve have two kids, Cain and Abel. Then you jump forward to chap page five, chapter five rather, and this text is on page 25. But anybody have different texts have different numbers. Like the Tanakh has a different number, chapter five of Genesis. Anybody have a different number than 25? That's totally different, okay. And on, and what, what is it? Anyway, f chapter five? 25. Yeah, that's 25 on this, but any, there's another. Chapter five. Okay, chapter, th no. well, it says chapter five in the big five. Okay. And what page is that on? Uh, 11. 
Okay, it's a different tale. 11, so it's 11, 25, and, it, and if chapter 5, verse number 3, Adam and Eve have two kids, Cain and Abel. In chapter 4, Cain, and, Cain murders Abel, Abel is, a Cain, Abel is dead, Cain is exiled, and now we have Cain's progeny then we, with no information but, of, of ages, but then we jump to chapter 5, and guess what the, the Bible burdens us with? Verse number 3. Adam had lived 130 years, and, and he parented with Sarah, with, with Eve, another kid, and he called him Seth. Do I really? See chapter 5, verse 3? Why do I care that they waited 130 years? Who cares? Well, the Torah clearly cares. And then you jump a few verses down, you see that, 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 was, that was Seth, and Seth hangs around with his wife for 105 years before she has verse number, verse number, uh, was that 6? Of course, a kid named Manish. I mean, do I really care that Seth waits 105 years before he and his wife get together to have a kid? Who cares? The Torah cares. Don't take for granted that the information is given to you just because the Bible decided to you know, bang your head around a bit. And you can, every year is given, every year with three figure accuracy, 130 years, 105 years, add, 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 on t right to, till the, with, to, to a Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then one of Jacob's sons, Joseph, is sold into slavery in Egypt, the beginning of the slavery, which we pass over, goes through in the spring of the year, okay? Every year is given. There's no wiggle room. You can add, add, add. You come, you get up to there. Then you have the time in Egypt. You come out of Egypt. You come to the end of the Hebrew Bible, coming into the land. The extra 40 years in the desert. And finally, you know, you know, that's the end. And Joshua takes the people into the land. So you got all those years into coming into the promised land. And the years are all given. And then you come after that and you add the kings and the queens and the rulers and the battles that took place and you come to the end of the Hebrew Bible, that's the Hebrew Bible of the, of, of the battles that took place to get the land. And then we come to the, the, again, the kings and the queens that set their president and you come to a number that at the moment plus or minus a hundred or so years because there's a question in the number, but the Bible's number today is 5779 years and in a few days if we pay, behave ourselves it'll be 5780, right? Rosh Hashanah is just about, ten, uh, about a week away or so, a bit more than about a week away. So, uh, so what? So that's how we get the, the six, that's less than 6,000 years. Torah's got 14 billion years. I mean, give me a break already. What's the answer? And they're both based on hard data. If you believe the Torah presents hard data, if you think it's just a fiction, then it doesn't make any difference. But the Torah is based on hard data. But this, of course, is not the whole answer, is not it? Because when Rosh Hashanah comes around, let's go back to the previous Rosh Hashanah, and we get to 57, 79 years, that doesn't go back to the creation, right? What, what does Rosh Hashanah commemorate? The creation of? Of Adam. Uh, be careful by saying man, because, what's your name? Eich? Uh, my wife's name, okay, so if you look at, do you still have Genesis chapter 5 open? Yeah. So read for me, Rachel, please, Genesis chapter 5, verse, uh, verse 2, the he there is man. Now, realize the text does not say man. Nowhere in the Hebrew text is the word man. The word is Adam. So if you can make your brain, when you get to the word man, realize it says Adam, we'll, be on, we'll both be on the same page. Rachel is now about to break the news to you that, shoot. Reading? Yeah. Uh, he so everyone can hear you. He created them male and female. He blessed them and called their name man. Ah! <laughs> we, Adam. we just got done saying, now read it all again. <laughs> It's amazing how you know, the mindset of human beings is amazing. That's because we see that also with vision, right? You know, you, you, if you see this, but you, you're always filling in stuff that isn't there. Okay, go ahead. Okay, on the day they were created. Start again. He, he, meaning God. He created them, male and female. He blessed them and called their name Adam. Don't look, look at the Hebrew. Adam. It says Adam. <laughs> on the day they were created. He, God ble called their name Adam. What's the implication of that sentence? No gender. What? No gender. I can't hear you. No gender. Well, he called them. Did What's the implication? There's two. Say it. There's two. Exactly. There's, There's Mr. Adam and Mrs. Adam. Yeah. That's why Mr. Adam had to learn Mrs. Adam, Isha. The Hebrew word for man is Ish. You'll notice in the Hebrew the word Ish doesn't appear. And Isha is woman. He calls her Isha, like English is the same. Man, how do you change man into the feminine? 
you add a prefix, woman. Right, man, woman, it's the same word. And the Hebrew is the same, because that's how Ish gets it. Ish, Isha. With the Hebrew, you add a suffix or something at the end, Ish, Isha, man, woman. And the English, man, woman, yet in the, in the beginning, so it's the same. He called their name Adam. This chapter has to work with chapter one, two, three, and four, unless you don't think the Bible is from God. And that, therefore, means that Adam, they were, and it says in chapter one also, that Adam was a Mr. Adam and Mrs. Adam. They were separated somehow. No one has a clue what all that, that's all about. And uh, eventually, Adam, Mr. Adam gets his act together and changes their name to Chava after he adds to the law and says, don't touch it, baby. Don't eat it. Don't it. it was Adam that added to the law. And then Eve, Eve followed, followed that and messed up the whole world. And uh, Adam, at that point, changes her name to Chava. And thank you, Rabbi Shlomo Riskin, for pointing out the, the Hebrew word Eve, the English word Eve, is the, is the translation, as it were, for the Hebrew word Chava. And if you look at that strange statement, then we've got to get, and we will get to the, right now, the, one second, just because it's so significant. Uh, it's in, uh, when, when do they eat the, it must be chapter, uh, when do they eat the forbidden fruit? And then he changes her name, uh, chapter three, yeah. And then, then they're, they're chastised. And then, it's interesting, then God, God curses the serpent, but doesn't curse Adam and Eve. God chastises Eve, and Mrs. the woman, Mrs. Adam, chastises, uh, chastises Adam, and in the very next sentence, let's see, look at, look at chapter, chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 20. Verse uh, 20, chapter 3. This is the very next sentence. Well, first read verse 20, so we know what I'm talking about. Read, read chapter 3, verse 19. Anyone. Rachel can do it also, since it's about men. Oh, no, man should actually. It has to do with man. So man should probably read it. Anyone read verse 19 really clearly? Come on, it's late. English? Yes. By the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread until you return to the ground from which you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust shall you return. Okay, that's God's chastising Adam. Now that's the end of the situation of God chastising Adam and Eve for eating the forbidden fruit. The very next sentence, what's your name? Uh, Natanel. Huh? Natanel. Natanel, Natanel, read the next sentence. The very next sentence. The man called his wife's name Eve. He Notice he changes her name immediately after there's no break. Immediately after Adam changes her name to Chava, why, why Natanel? He tells you right in the sentence. Because she had become the mother of all the living. Isn't that a bizarre? Chava is the, the Hebrew word. Chava means the mother of all living. That doesn't mean Chava doesn't mean life. What's the word that means life? Chaya. Chaya. Why do you name her Chaya? Why do you name her Chava and not Chaya? Hi, there are lots of women named Chaya. Lots of women named Chava. There's a world of difference between the two words. Chaya was what, if that sentence made, you know, simple, superficial sense, it would be Chaya. But Chava, thank you, Rabbi Shlomo Riskin, for pointing out that Chava is defined, the meaning of Chava is defined in Psalm 19. It's the first Psalm in the Ashkenazi service, maybe Svarty also, that is added on holidays and on Shabbos, it's the first added psalm, once the services get going. It says, Lila to Lila, 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 I don't like to do it from memory. You got it in front of you, anybody? Lila, 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 uh, says something, no. Yom, Li Yom, speaks, I don't have it in front of me. And Lila, Vila, Yehaveh Dat, from the word Chava, Yehaveh Dat, reveals. Chava is a, is a level of insight that reveals a deeper level of knowledge within a fact. It says, it says day to day speaks about something, and, li and, li and night, Lila's night, and night to night, Yehoved reveals dot, in, dot, wisdom. So Adam realized that he had screwed up the world royally by telling Eve, don't eat it, don't even touch it. So she thinks that came from God. So when touching takes place and nothing happens, she thinks the whole story's a bunch of baloney. So she eats. 
it wasn't, he didn't present it as a gezerah. Don't eat it, babe, you know, but maybe you shouldn't even touch it. You know, God says don't eat it, but babe, maybe you shouldn't even touch it. So then she would know touching has no significance from a divine point of view. So he had to have told her don't eat it and don't touch it as if it came from God. That's a big problem of adding to the law in God's name. That is why throughout the entire Torah, when it talks about changing the Torah, it never says don't subtract and don't add. It's never that order. It is always don't add and don't subtract. Adding to the law got us into the situation we are in today if we think the Bible has even a remnant of being true. You know, a hint of what happened, even if, even if it's only poetic or, 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 or sim symbolic. But anyway, okay, the age of the universe. So we have these two different ages of the universe, which is what it's on the, it sets what's on this outside. So how does, this, how does it work? My name's Jerry Schroeder. My background's MIT, bachelor's, master's, PhD, seven years in the physics staff, and I always point out I've seen a lot of atomic bombs detonated, so my suggestion is praying for peace is sweet, but it's not going to bring peace. You've got to work for peace. You should pray as if everything counts on God and act as if everything counts on you. Right? Everyone says that. I don't know if I'm getting that person. But in any event, in any event, what's the secret? Nachmanides gives us the secret of the age of the universe. We've got two ages on here. So let's just jump back to Genesis chapter 1, and he gives an amazing piece of insight. First of all, I'm, we're not going to get to it, but in Parshat Sav, in Leviticus chapter 8, Rabbi Tanhuma, which goes back 1900 years, brings a statement that is learned from the book of, of, the book of Isaiah chapter 40, that the universe started as a speck and expanded out. You can find it yourself. I'm not going to get into it. It's, 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 it's the Rav Tanchuma, and it's in Parsha Tzav. It's the, each Torah reading has a name to it. So I'll be like a man. But it's, anyway, it's Leviticus chapter 8, verse 2 and 3. And you look at Rabbi Tanchuma, and then you'll see his, his discussion of this. I don't want to get into it. The universe starts in a, it's the book of the third book, Genesis, Leviticus, the third book of the Bible, very clear. Okay. The universe starts at a point and expands out. Science discovers this a few thousand years later. He learned it from the wording in, the, in, in, chap, in, in that chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. Okay. If you read it about 1,400 times, you'll get it also, but I suggest that you save the reading by going to. So the universe expands out. We have an expanding universe, and that's how we get the 14 billion years, by looking at the stretching of space. So how, do, how, does, it, how does this happen? Now remember that as... Now, I don't remember who pointed out that, uh, Rachel, did you, you say, you said that, that Rosh Hashanah, who said that Rosh Hashanah commemorates the creation of Adam? Hmm? This, this gal here? Rachel, okay. So the age of the universe as of last Rosh Hashanah wasn't 57, 79 years, but that plus what? Six days, right? Because Rosh Hashanah, the new year does not, is not counted from the creation of the world. You realize that. Everyone should realize that. In the coming next week from now, when, when the shofar is blown and we say, Hayom Harat Olam, this is the birthday of the world. I, I think Svarty may say it also, but in Hebrew, the, the statement fo immediately following the blowing of the shofar, the only time when everyone is listening, because I can guarantee you right now, in this room, not everyone is listening. I can guarantee it. Maybe I'm not even listening. But in any event, but in any event, this is the birthday of the world. Today we stand in judgment. You'll see that said six times over on the two days of Rosh Hashanah. This is the birthday of the world. Today we stand in judgment. So why should the birthday of the world be standing in judgment? Because it relates to not the creation of the world, but the creation of, of, the, of the soul of humanity, which locks in us and our relationship to God, because before you had the soul of humanity, the neshama, you couldn't stand in judgment. And that, that is Genesis, that is Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, where it says that God creates the Adam, et ha-adam. God does not create Adam in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. God creates the Adam. Thank you, Peggy Kitts, for pointing that out. God says, let us make Adam in verse 26, but God creates the Adam. 
It's a zap. If God zaps something in, that creation, according to the Ramban, Nachmanis, cannot be physical. It has to be spiritual. The only physical creation is the first sentence of the Bible. So it's the soul of humanity. Just like in verse 21, where God creates all those animals, I forget the translations, the guesses, but the animals, that creation can't be their bodies, it's their soul, it's the nefesh. So humans have a nefesh and a neshama, but the neshama comes in here, and that's Rosh Hashanah. That's the beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, today, this is the birthday of the world, today you stand in judgment. Because judgment can only occur when you have the soul of humanity. Lions eating lions may not be nice for the other lion. It, but it's not, it, it's not immoral. Lions eating people may not be nice for people. But the lions aren't immoral. They, don't have, they have a nefesh. They don't have a neshama on top of that. So the nefesh marks a change from a, of a world inhabited by animals. My, 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 Maimonides describes some of them as having the same shape and intelligence as us, Homo sapiens sapiens. They just love you. They just weren't, they just weren't humans. And then the neshama comes in and, and it, Ha'adam gets it and then gradually the neshama changes. We don't have time to get into all of that, that today we've talked about in other sessions. But nonetheless, that changes the world. Therefore, on Rosh Hashanah, you can say this is the birthday of the world. Today we stand in judgment. And that's Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. The soul. Actually, you had a question? No? Okay. So, so, so we, have, we, have, uh, we have this. Okay, so we have the soul of humanity coming in and the uh, six days of Genesis. Now the usual answer is to change these 6,000 years, this lesson to 14 billion years, is saying that the days weren't days, they were long periods of time. I would like to see a show of hands, even if you don't believe it. Have you ever heard, even in a dream, let alone in words, that the days of Genesis were not really 24 days, they were long periods of time? Anyone ever heard that? Almost everyone's actually heard that. You never heard that? I heard it, yeah. Oh, so why don't you raise your hand? Okay, see, I told you. I, that is proof, you understand? You can be screaming and not everyone is. You don't have to bang the table. Okay, yeah, it's wrong. Both Rashi, the 1090, and Nachmanides, the two major commentators, many others also, but Rashi, the 1090, long before, like dinosaurs, what about them? And Nachmanides, the Ramban, the 1250, say the days are 24 hours each. There's no wiggle room. It's not sunrise, sunset. It's that they are 24-hour days, which is interesting that they have to say that because the text says yom. Yom means day. In the, at the evening, morning, day one, evening, morning, a second day, the word day is used. They apparently, I would guess that they make that statement because the sun's not mentioned till the fourth day. In fact, in my, in my book, I actually have a footnote. <laughs> they were aware of the fact that the sun isn't mentioned because I get emails all the time, but the sun doesn't reach till fourth day, so how can you have day? You don't need a sun and the moon to have to, thank you, what's your name? Harry. Harry? Hey. Three points out, you, you don't need the sun and the moon to perceive time. What you need is something, you know, time passing. So the word day relates to 24 hours, and the Ramban says not only 24 hours, but like the six days of our work week. So you can't say the hours are different, so it's locked in. There are six 24-hour days. And from, so that means from the Big Bang creation to verse 27, if you look quickly at Genesis chapter 1, day number 6, you will discover that you count up the verses in day number six, which starts in verse 24 into verse 20, 31, that Adam is spot on halfway through the sixth day, and therefore the, the, the Talmud tells us it wasn't six days, it was five and a half days, makes it even worse. That is, the calendar switches with verse 27 the cal of Genesis 1, switches from a, a, a view in which these days are like, who knows what, cosmic days or not, to something else, because Adam is created, and that's the soul, five and a half days, not six days. It seems like a small point, but it is the Talmud statement. <coughs> it, and and they don't, at least I recall the Talmud, it doesn't say why, but here's a clear example. Count up the number of verses on day number six, Adam is spot on, halfway through the sixth day. So it's five and a half days. So you have five and a half 24 hour days to get up to here. And then from here forward you have the 57, 79 years. So from here to here you got five and a half days. 
And then you have after that the 57, 79 years that gets us till, 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 till today, the history as we know it. First, we notice one thing very clearly is that the description of time in Genesis chapter 1 is unique to Genesis chapter 1. Nowhere in the entire Hebrew Bible is that couplet, evening, morning, if he had a revoker, you know, and then the day. If he had revoker at the end of each day, and it's, a mis it's not a good translation because there's no sun yet, but we don't have time to get in into that, that. We've talked about this previously, that the actual deeper meaning of evening and morning actually is, co is a chaos and cosmos, but in any event, the, that, that couplet, Erev Invoker, or in the popular translation, evening and morning, is nowhere else. Evening is mentioned elsewhere, morning is mentioned, but that couplet to mark, is, to mark the passage is nowhere else. It is unique. So Genesis chapter 1, from the beginning up to verse 27, is a unique time, and at which point Adam gets in the Shema, we get the break, and then it switches from a different perspective of time. But what's that perspective? And we are led by the nose by these commentators. They point out, if you go look at the end of the first sentence, Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, evening, morning, day 1, Yom Echad. Genesis chapter 1, verse 8, evening, morning, a second day. Genesis chapter 1, verse 13, evening and morning, a third day, a fourth day, a fifth day, the sixth day. So the obvious question, and once you point out, that, once it's pointed out that it's obvious, it sure wasn't obvious to me or to anyone else that it was pointed out, why does the text say day one when it says second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, the sixth day? Why doesn't it say a first day? That's the whole answer to the age of the universe. Nachmanides points out, but many of the commentators do also, that the text couldn't write a first day on the first day, because the only time you can write first is when it's relative to a second. The world has proven that in several situations. One situation was, well for me, it was gruesome in both of them. But for one of the worldwide situation in the First World War, who called the First World War the First World War during the First World War? Not quite, not quite. The pessimists. Everyone else called it the Great War. The pessimists turned out to be right. Came the Second World War, and the f that Great War became... I, I, I always give my own perfect example. I fought in the First Lebanese War. When I was fighting in the First Lebanese War, neither I nor my four buddies that didn't come back from the First Lebanese War said we're fighting in the First Lebanese War. Now that's strange, but we were fighting in the First Lebanese War. Why didn't we say we were fighting in the First Lebanese War? Why? it wasn't yet a second. Now I have to say the first Lebanese war. The Torah writes day one, because guess what? There wasn't a second day. I wish I figured it out, but I didn't. But it's good I didn't figure it out, because then it would be me bending the Bible. These ancient commentators said the Torah says day one, because the Torah sees time from the beginning looking forward. We look back in time, we look back in time, and we measure 14 billion years, and those years went by. How would they be perceived? The operational word here is perception. How would they be perceived from the Bible's point of view, looking forward from day one? This is a NASA diagram. It has nothing to do with Asia tour. Okay, it's right off the web. Everyone should own this. I say it again. N-A-S-A, -A, get there, then type in W-M-A-P, and you got your history of the universe. So the Torah sees time before there was a second day. That means it sees time from the beginning looking forward. We look back in time and we see 14 billion years. But how would it be if I had to send all this information back in time? How would that perception of time and the operational world here is perception? The days are, from one viewpoint, literally perceived as five and a half, 24 hour days. The days are from our measurement of time, 14 billion years. Those years went by. There were dinosaurs that appear about two, approximately 230, 240 million years ago. The dinosaurs disappear about 65 million years. A force from outer space destroys them. Again, a force from outer space, nature using. Life on Earth, the first indications of life, 38 billion years. That's nine zeros. Life remained one cell for almost three billion years. It couldn't, it didn't break into this amazing change to be to multicellular to a major change to change in cell structure uh, the er earth and the and the solar system looks like it's about four point four and a half point point six billion years with nine zeros and the universe about 14 billion years our sun is not a first generation star there's no 
possibility when Rabbi Abahu, I don't have know if he was meant this or not, but when Rabbi Abahu states that, that, that uh, the reason that the sun is mentioned on the fourth day is because God made and destroyed worlds before this, I have no idea when he writes that in, in Talmudic time, if he's referring to this, but ours, there were worlds that were destroyed. I'm not talking about on our earth. But our sun cannot be a first generation star. First generation stars do not have the elements that make up life. First generation stars have hybrid helium, helium and a bit of lithium. Our sun is loaded with carbon, oxygen, iron, you know, our whole solar system. We had to have been the result. And those took billions of years to occur and explode and the stars explode and then the debris of the old stars, etc. So we live in an old universe, but the Torah makes this outrageous claim that it's five and a half, it's like a joke, 24. Or maybe they got it right though, since it has a good track record of being correct. For instance, there was a creation. So how does that work? So the Torah sees time from the beginning. I hope that's not me. Maybe it is, but I haven't. No, it's some, yeah, you have your hand up, but you only yeah. have about two minutes left in the class. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, so you said uh, like evening and morning aren't to be understood as evening and morning? Or no, I didn't say that. Nachmanini says it. Oh, okay. Years ago. But if you go to my website, you, you, you see the, uh, you see the, it, because there's no sun around. But the root meaning of evening, Ediv, is mixture. The root meaning, the root meaning of Ediv isn't evening. The root meaning of Ediv is ik mixture, chaos. He points out in the evening what happens to vision becomes chaotic. So you call it the root meaning of bokeh, morning, isn't, is clarity. Because when the sun rises, clarity comes. So the flow is really from, from chaos to chaos, which is amazing because that's what happened in the world. Light beams became alive. Is that my phone? No, there's somebody else's. Okay. Okay. No, it's probably also. Anyway, okay, so what happened? So now we suddenly have, we have this, the Torah from Bet Yom Echad, because if the Torah, here's the key. If the Torah was seeing time from Sinai, okay, which is when the Torah was given with Moses on Sinai, whether, the, whether Sinai's in the Sinai Peninsula of Saudi Arabia at this point is, is irrelevant, but we're talking about Sinai. Well, the, from Adam to Moses on Sinai, there's some debate, but no one says it's less than 2,448 years. Oh, times 365 days a year comes out to be something like, I think it's 383,000 days. I mean, there have been hundreds of thousands of days. This is the Torah on Sinai. So, so if the Torah was seen from Sinai looking back in time, the text would have said a first day. There have been hundreds of thousands of second days. The only perspective that would make the Torah say day one is from the beginning looking forward. I, I'm, I'm so happy I didn't figure that out by myself because then it would be completely unfair because I, you know, anyone in this room, we've all heard about dinosaurs who'd be bending the Bible. So the Torah sees time from the beginning looking forward. So, what, so what's the key? We have exactly uh, three minutes left. Quick thought experiment. Galaxy over here, big and beautiful. Us over here in Jerusalem, this telescope, that is some great galaxy, but of course we don't see it lifetime, right? The light has to travel to us through space. So what happens on the galaxy, a star explodes, boom, supernova. Light goes out in all directions, it's the same in all directions, and we're just going to talk about the light coming towards our big telescope. A week later, another supernova. Two gigantic bursts of light in a galaxy far, far away. First burst travels out, and the second burst a week later. Now, if this stood still, this would catch it in a week, but obviously they're both moving through space. But as they move through time and space, what's space doing? Hmm? Distorting. What? Is it distorting? Yeah, because space is stretching. So the distances become further and further. So let's say the universe doubles in size. So we have one week apart, the space travel. But now we get to our telescope, the, the universe is now twice as big. First burst hits the telescope, wow, boom, a supernova. How much later does the second burst reach us? Space is now twice as big. How big, how much time? Twice exactly, two weeks. My measured reality is two weeks. That is what I know about the world. But I can call up, I can call up an astronomer how far back, etc. time. And now I can go mathematically back in time. And then what happens to the perception of time? It contracts. It's an exact relationship. It's just amazing. I was just a lucky guy to put the numbers in the calculation. Because if I couldn't do this calculation, let's say 50 years ago, by maybe 40, 40, 40 years to the beginning, 
but only like in the last 20, 25 years do we have the data that you can put the numbers in. Now, on my, in my website, GeraldSchroeder.com, I have a, uh, I, I have the exact calculation described there, okay? It's, it's a, uh, it's a nonlinear relationship. It's the most common relationship in the world. Well, why would it be nonlinear? Because I'll just use the example of the universe doubling. Every time the universe doubles in size, the perception of time halves because you know, you've got the stretching, right? The perception. Remember, it's the word perception. So the rate of doubling is not linear. Even if, the, even if this were completely linear, straight, you know, one, two, three, four, five, then it, uh, if this were linear, if this were linear, even with that, the rate of change would not be constant, but it's, it's how should I say it? As the universe gets larger, it takes longer for the universe to double in size, okay? Or triple in size, the quadruple is using double as an example. As soon as I move my hands apart, my fingers apart, or even uh, my fingers apart, I'm going to say double every time the space between them double. Let's say this is the beginning, and these are two points in space just after the creation, okay? Double, 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 double. Notice what happens, it takes longer and longer for the space to double in size, right? And the beginning is very rapid. So what does that mean? That, that as the days go by, the rate of doubling is slower, so that the amount of time full of our time, of our billions of years that are perceived within each of those days becomes longer and uh, becomes, how should I say that, shorter and shorter. So that when you run the equation out, which is on my website, okay, the, the, the basic equation is, and then we'll just, I'll just go to the number. The basic equation is A, the time is perceived on the, in, in days of Earth time equals A zero. A0 is this instantaneous ratio of size or temperature or whatever between here and here at that first instant. Okay, but it changes immediately because the universe is, is expanding and it, exchange, it changes according to this relation. I'm going to use an English letter as opposed to Greek. Lambda T. And then, and then what you do is you integrate this equation from T equals zero to T equals five and a half. I have no control of these numbers. It's just absolutely, it is totally, how should I say, uh, cosmology numbers. My background is nuclear physics. I just lifted the numbers off the, off the data pages and what you come out to be as a normalized number, I, I don't want to put the whole equation on because we don't have the, not that you don't have time, or just, everybody's mind just turns off and you start getting s science in, in the, in, in, on the board. But what it comes out to be, and again, I have zero control. I'll make that very clear. I have no control. These are science numbers straight out of cosmology. I have no control over them whatsoever. But what comes out when you integrate the system and you go from zero to five and a half, the number that you get is 900 billion. And what is that 900 billion? It's the ratio, the average ratio between the perception of time here to here. That's just what the equation is looking at. It's looking at the rate of change and going back to here, which you can, as I say, if you want to see the details, it's, it's, uh, it's called the, 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 the Age of the Universe, or it's an article on my website, which means that ratio, and it has no units, make it clear. If I have a 10 degrees, 